Good evening. It's 7 p.m. March 14th, 2024, and I'd like to welcome everyone in the room and those who are participating online as I call to order this meeting of the Bellbrook Sugar Creek Board of Education for the purpose of conducting the school district's business. We value everyone's input and have made sure to dedicate a portion of this meeting to hear from you. We look forward to your comments during that time as it's indicated on the agenda. Mr. Lyman, we please call the roll. Mrs. Anderson? Here. Mrs. Dorn? Here. Mr. Kinsey? Present. Mr. Price? Here. Dr. Pryor? Present. All right, we have a quorum. If you're able, will you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Treasurer's report. Okay, could I get a motion to approve the uh, minutes from the meeting uh, dated February 8th? So moved. Second. Mrs. Dorn and then Mrs. Anderson. Questions, corrections? Please call the roll. Mrs. Anderson? Yes. Mrs. Dorn? Yes. Mr. Kinsey? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes. And Dr. Pryor? Yes. I get a motion to approve the minutes from the February 22nd meeting. So moved. Second. Mrs. Anderson and then Mrs. Dorn. Questions? Okay, please call the roll. Mrs. Dorn? Yes. Mr. Kinsey? Yes. Mr. Price? I'm staying. I wasn't present. So. Dr. Pryor? Yes. And Mrs. Anderson? Yes. All right, motion passes. I get a motion to approve the treasurer's report uh, for the month ending February 29th. So moved. Second. Mrs. Dorn, then Dr. Pryor. Uh, just a few things. Uh, we currently only have about, we, we always like to talk about the state funding percentage mm -hmm. of our revenue and uh, we're at about 21% right now, but that's a little lower than usual because we, uh, our real estate tax, local real estate tax money is coming in, which is not state funding. So that makes the state percentage go down a little bit, but uh, we're about 21% there. And uh, we have, a, a uh, as we've said many times, an unusually large percentage of our revenue from local <coughs> sources compared to other districts. Our uh, percentage for salaries and wages out of our budget uh, for expenditures is 74 percent and um, we have uh, as I mentioned about 72 percent for real estate taxes and revenue uh, the, the financial report details were included with agenda does anyone have any questions about anything in that report what's what purchase services again it's it's the best way to say it is it's everything that we spend money on that is not salaries wages benefits uh, supplies, equipment, uh, it's, it's uh, services like the, the big portion of it is the Greene County ESC services. Um, other things like utilities and repairs to the building and uh, legal expenses and uh, anything like that that's not a salary benefit supplier material. Other questions? Please call the roll. Mr. Kinsey? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes. Dr. Pryor? <clears throat> Mrs. Anderson? Yes. Mrs. Dorn? Yes. <clears throat> Could I get a motion to approve the permanent appropriation amendments for the 23-24 fiscal year in the amount of $10,639.85 for federal grant allocation increases? So moved. Second. Mrs. Anderson and then Mrs. Dorn. I really don't have anything to comment on that. It's pretty standard. Yeah, lot. standard, yeah. typical now. Questions? Okay. Please call the roll. Mr. Price? Yes. Dr. Pryor? Yes. Mrs. Anderson? Yes. Mrs. Dorn? Yes. Mr. Kinsey? Yes. Thank you. Uh, that takes us into correspondence. Anybody have anything that they would like to share for the good of the rest of the board? No? 
Okay, we'll move on then to reports to the board. Uh, I'd like to welcome Bridget Pritchard. Thank you so much for being here. We're gonna hear all about special education. Good evening. Um, bear with me. I thought that I would be able to look at the notes from my laptop, but now I have all these noisy papers that's going to bump into the mic, so I apologize. Because that's how it goes. All right, um, good evening, members of the board. Uh, my name is Bridget Pritchard. I'm the Director of Special Education here at BSS. Um, today I'm gonna to provide a broad overview of special education, its purpose, the beneficiaries, and monitoring methods. Um, I trust that our discussion will offer valuable insights this evening. Um, the reason I say a broad overview is because really I could talk for a month straight about special ed and still not hit a fourth of the information that it pertains to. Okay, so before we start with what special ed is, we're gonna start with what it is not. It is not any of these things solely in itself, right? It is a collaborative um, partnership between parents and teachers, and administrators, community members, um, board members. So it is not any of these things solely by itself. And I hadn't prepared to flip through the papers, like I said earlier. <laughs> um, okay, so special education embodies the fundamental belief in the inherent worth and potential of every individual, regardless of their abilities or challenges. It is grounded in the principle of inclusivity, recognizing that every student deserves equitable access to education and opportunities for growth. Special education emphasizes the importance of individualized supports and tailored interventions to address the unique needs of each learner. <clears throat> it embraces diversity, celebrates the richness of human variation, acknowledging that different students may require different approaches to learn and develop. At its core, special education reflects commitment to fostering a nurturing and supportive learning environment where all students can thrive, achieve their goals, and contribute meaningfully to society. It embodies beliefs that education is not merely about academics, but also about empowering individuals to lead fulfilling and purposeful lives regardless of any perceived limitations or challenges they may face. There's no way I could have memorized that, so I read it directly. Um, so what is special education? It is specially designed instruction. Um, special education refers to the SDI that meets the unique needs of the students with disabilities and allows them to access and make progress in the general, general ed curriculum. It's not a one-size-fit-all approach, but rather an individual plan to address the student's strengths, needs, and learning styles. 
It can be provided in most environments. Special education services may include accommodations, modifications, assistive technology, specialized instruction, and related services such as speech therapy or occupational therapy, to name a few. Special education is meant to be portable and transferable to help close the learning gap of our students. Okay, so I mentioned specially designed instruction. In order to be eligible for special education services, a child must have a qualifying disability that adversely impacts their learning in the classroom. Um, they must have a specific and individualized need related to their disability that causes them to not be able to access learning um, in the same way that their peers are able to. Specially designed instruction, or SDI, as you'll hear all the ISs call it, um, is the instruction that is created for a student based on their needs, whether that be social, emotional, functional, or academic. It allows for modifications or adaptations to the content being taught and allows access to the general ed curriculum. SDI is the focal point for which the entire IEP is wrapped around. Um, it's derived from a child's measurable annual goals that's written inside the IEP. And I'll talk just a little bit about that in a minute. Um, great. So anytime you see an underline, that means that the presentation has been hyperlinked and you guys can look further into the information to find out more. Specifically here, I've attached the Ohio, nope, not Ohio, the Department of Education and Workforce, aka ODE, um, their breakdown of what each disability in the category is um, and how students will qualify for that. So qualifying disabilities, it says the eligibility criteria are determined by Ohio state law. All Ohio school districts are required to provide FAPE, which is a free and appropriate public education to children with disabilities in accordance with IDEA. There are cur currently 14 disabilities that Ohio recognizes for special education um, I'm not going to read all 14, but these are how our students qualify here currently. So currently at BSS, there are 493 preschool age children participating in the special ed program. The rise in our enrollment is by 20% since 2019 and has led to significant adjustments within our special ed pro program. Um, not only have we seen an increase in caseloads for our psychologists, our intervention specialists, and our related service providers, but it has also prompted us to implement additional support systems and resources to ensure individualized needs are met for each student in the most effective way. This surge in demand underscores the importance of ongoing professional development for our teachers, our admin, our related service personnel, and our director, um, and collaboration among our staff to maintain high quality services for all the students that are enrolled. Bridges, that Percentage is that kind of typical? I mean, throughout the U.S., as far as the, that's about 15 percent. Just doing some quick math in my head here, of our overall enrollment. Is that somewhat typical of throughout the country, or <laughs> nothing's ever typical in special ed? Um, it, it it varies district to district, school to school. Um, I think that for our population, that is a large number having come from a, a different district, a bigger district. Um, I think that that's a pretty heavy number, 415. Okay. Any other questions? Jet? Um, so this graph is a breakdown of our school age students by disability category. And I know it's super small. I thought it would come out bigger. There are four categories that stand out more so than any other. Um, and those are other health impaired, and those are students with chronic or acute health problems that affect their educational performance. Um, so they may have things like asthma, diabetes, epilepsy, or ADHD, or a combination. There's 
speech and language, and that's for children who have articulation disorders or language delays. Um, there is specific learning disabilities, and you'll hear that again in a couple of slides because we're working through that right now. And that is a neurodevelopmental condition characterized by persistent difficulties in acquiring and using academic skills. I took this straight from the definition. Primarily students who are significantly below grade level. Um, so that is alarming to have such a large number, especially um, if it's identifying students that should be on grade level, but they're not. And then there's autism. Um, it's a complex developmental condition that typically appears during early childhood and affects communication, social interaction, and behavior sometimes, um, along with a lot of other things. Autism is really just a broad scope of so many other um, obstacles that our kids um, work with. And that is not to minimize any of the other disabilities that we have. We also have multiple disabilities. We have deafness, visual impairment, orthopedic impairment. We have students that have emotional disturbances, intellectual disabilities, and developmental disabilities. So right now, these are the disabilities that we service here in our district for our students. So just because a student um, qualifies for one disability under IDEA, which the law says in Ohio, we can only identify a kid for one disability, it doesn't mean that they don't have a um, compilation of other things going on. They may be dual diagnosed. I know there are several states, I taught in Kentucky, where they would have dual diagnosis for their students. Um, here Ohio says you just get one and we service you based on whatever other needs that you may manifest as a kid. Okay, so how do students get identified? Identifying students with disabilities begins when concerns arise from the parent or from the school regarding a student's progress in the gen ed classroom, usually gen ed curriculum. Before or during evaluation, the district is required to offer targeted interventions to support not only those kids whose parents may have requested it, but every student that may be struggling. Upon receiving the request for evaluation, or initial for evaluation, the district then has 30 days um, to respond and acquire parent consent. So the district is gonna reach back out to the parent and, or guardian and let them know, um, yes, we do agree with you, we suspect the child may have a disability, or no, you know, we've provided interventions and the interventions are working, so um, I think we're good to go. Um, after reviewing the data, the ETR team determines that special education eligibility is um, gonna be applied for the student. Um, and then an initial IEP is developed by the IEP team. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Subsequently, within 30 days, the evaluation team, along with the parent, identifies the eligibility category. And all that means is within 30 days, everyone on the ETR team gets together and they decide what disability best fits the kid based on the needs and the data that was collected. Um, once that is done, then the parent agrees or disagrees, and now it is time to draft the initial IEP, and that consists of another team with different team members that are kind of still the same team members. If the evaluation um, concludes that a child does not meet criteria for special education, does not qualify for a disability, then that student just simply returns to the genetic curriculum. Okay, so we mentioned the IEP. So what is an IEP? Um, IEP stands for Individual Education Plan or Program, and it is tailored um, for the student that has the disability and it outlines the supports that they need specifically 
to compete and progress and succeed in the general education classroom. It's developed in collaboration by a team that includes the parents, the gen ed teachers, intervention specialists, and a district representative. There are related service personnel that may show up to a meeting, but they are not required team members. Um, and that's if the student qualifies for a related service. All team members have equal rights. However, the district representative has the authority to make any final decisions when the team is unable to come to a consensus. Information from the evaluation team report is then prioritized based on what the student needs to do first and what is most significant, and then an IEP is drafted in that regard. It's reviewed and updated annually using progress monitoring data. So our ISs send home progress reports quarterly, and it's just the outline of what the goals are, the student's objectives, and how well they're progressing towards meeting those goals. The IEP includes the student's current academic, functional, and social emotional levels, learning goals, instruction methods, and transitions to independent living goals. It is a living document that can be amended and revised at any time based on any changes in relation to progress or student regression. Amendments and revisions within the IEP should come from the documented data that the team collects. So within the IEP, there's something called the LRE, and that is the Least Restrictive Environment. Um, I like to say Least Restrictive Services. I believe that special education is a service and it shouldn't be a location. Um, it shouldn't be a place where kids are put, but it should be a service that the team has collaborated on in order to support the needs of a student. IDEA mandates that children with disabilities receive education in the least restrictive environment um, this means that ensuring access to general education classes and curriculum whenever possible. So what that means is, in my triangle right here, IDEA states that when a kid is evaluated and identified for services, then they have rights to the most or the least restrictive environment first, right? If, as long as it's feasible. Um, so that would be this bottom bar right here. That's a general education classroom. As supports and interventions are put in place and data is collected, if necessary, those environments and those services become more restrictive. So the more restrictive the service, then the environment may have to change depending on what's being provided to the student. So the IEP team must first consider placing the student in a gen ed class and provide necessary modifications and aids for satisfactory education and progress. If the team determines the gen ed classroom isn't suitable, other placement options and service models outside of it to provide a free and appropriate public education are explored by the entire IEP team. These options constitute the continuum of alternate placements, or it's called a continuum of services, and that's what that model is, um, and it is required by law. So it is required that the IEP team look at all models of service in all environments to make sure that they are providing FAPE to the child. Ms. Pritchard, is the parent, where do the parents fall in this team process? Is, do, do they get an input on the LRE? Is it strictly like the district personnel? That's a great question. And it depends on what the situation is. Okay. The parent is an equal team member. Um, they are the expert on the child. If it is an initial IEP, then it is a team decision, and we will start in the general education classroom. If the team decides from that initial evaluation, that initial IEP meeting, that the child needs a resource room or a self-contained classroom or a combination of two or three of those things, then that is a stay put. Um, you're gonna make me go real deep. <laughs> if it is decided, if this is a annual review, so the kid already has an IEP, and it was decided that the Gen Ed classroom was the best place, and data is collected, and now the team is thinking, 
will, they're not progressing towards meeting their goals. Um, they may be failing in classes. The instruction or the interventions are not working and they want to change the LRE, then they need parental consent unless it is a behavior situation. Yeah. Please. Ideally, we would like to be perfect and get it right the first time. That always happens, never. Um, so annually, it could happen annually. Um, sometimes the child stays in the services or the environment their whole career of an IEP. So it really is determined by need and data and team input. So it, they could stay for a week, they could stay for 12 years. So it depends on the team and what their goal is. Is it ever more often than, than IEP update, like an annual IEP update? Yeah, it could be whenever the parent requests a meeting. Good questions. Now I gotta flip back and forth. This is great. Okay, so there is a caveat. Um, if the general education classroom <coughs> has to be modified, so say we stick a kid in the gen ed classroom, um, and that curriculum has to be modified and accommodated and tailored to the extent that the content is no longer recognizable and the student is not engaged and they're not making progress and they're not participating meaningfully, um, with their peers, then the team may want to consider other service models and placement options. And I say that because there's a term called invisible walls, where even though a child is in a gen ed classroom, they may be excluded from what's really going on in the entire environment, right? So that's called mainstreaming, and sometimes we mix that with inclusivity. Um, it's not the same thing. If the child isn't getting the education, it's not, um, it's not meaningful to them. And we no longer recognize the curriculum that's being taught. It doesn't look the same as what their peers are getting. Then that is called invisible walls. Um, and the IEP team, it's, their really, it's really their responsibility to reconvene and point that out to the parent based on data and make decisions. Now, to go back to Mrs. Anderson's point, the parent has control at that point because they're in the gen ed classroom and all we can do is state what's going on and allow the parent to consent or revoke what's being offered. I didn't think it was going to take this long. So exiting services. <clears throat> exiting services means that the special ed has ended. Um, it is not a time to mourn. It's not sad. It should be a time of celebration because what that means is our kids are making progress, they're doing great, they don't need um, any services, they don't need special attention, they are independent. So just keep that in mind. Um, I know it's sad to remove services. As a parent, I can't imagine um, not coddling and helping my kids the way that I do. It makes me sad every time they show their independence for me. So just being mindful that if an IEP team recommends exiting a service or exiting from special education, if they've done their due diligence, that should be a time to celebrate the student. So special education services may end, um, and that's referred to as exiting, and that can happen for various reasons. The parents must always be informed in all cases where the services are gonna be terminated, and um, that is the recommendation of the IEP team. This recommendation requires updated testing. So when a kid is taken off services, they have to reevaluate to a certain extent, um, depending on what services is being removed. And the team must convene or reconvene to discuss the options. So reasons for ending services include student achieving their IEP goals, yay, um, where the disability no longer impacts their education, students no longer meeting disability criteria, so it's saying that whatever disability we identified, it's not there anymore, and that is a possibility. The parent requests that their kid be removed from special education, 
which they have every right, and the IEP team does not have to consent to that. Um, graduation is pretty simple. The kid has matriculated out, and they are no longer a part of BSS. And then if the student ages out, um, so services will end on the day before, I always get this wrong, um, the student's 22nd birthday. So they can go to school until they're 22.9, 21.9. Okay, so here's the juicy stuff. Who monitors? Um, who monitors special education? So now that we've dipped our tiny toe right at the tip into the ocean of special education, um, we're going to talk about our profiles and our ratings. Here we go. So the special ed profile established under IDEA in 2004 assessed the services and outcomes for students with disabilities. <clears throat> Each year, districts across Ohio receive a profile that summarizes progress in meeting specific goals for our students. It helps districts use academic data to enhance special education services within the district. So the profile for the 2023-2024 is primarily based on data that's submitted by districts to the Education Management Information System, or EMIS, for the previous year. So all of our ratings will come out a year in the rears. So Ohio has indicators, and these indicators are a part of the profile, and the indicators are attached to six essential questions that Ohio created based on the IDEA model. Um, the indicators are organized um, to help guide continuous improvement in the areas of special education, and they want to know by these six questions. One, how well are our students prepared for kindergarten? How our students are performing in school? If our students are included in regular education classes? How ready our students are for life after high school? What services our students get if they have disabilities? And if the services that we provide are fair and equitable. So these questions help schools use data to make services better for kids with disabilities. Um, the special education profile tells districts how well they're doing on important things that are outlined from IDEA. So here's what we were waiting for, our ratings. And again, um, if you click on our ratings, it's hyperlinked. And also within the presentation, every year that's highlighted in blue, I've included the full ratings report and profile for you to look at. Um, if there's a hyperlink here in blue, then it breaks down what the indicator is specifically and it lets you know exactly what's being measured. Um, so that's there for you. At the top here are the six questions. This is actually what the profile will start with. So let's talk about this. The special education ratings are released annually in two phases. You have a winter phase, usually around October, and then you have a phase that comes out in May. This year they kind of cheated and they released something in January, but it wasn't the full report. It was the 22-23, and that's why there's blank spaces because all the ratings haven't been released yet. So the Department of Education Workforce offers opportunities to correct what's in red by aligning processes with state requirements. Oh, I forgot to break down. I'm sure you can guess what red means. Um, green means we're good to go. <laughs> Blue means that we haven't been rated yet. And orange is a data reporting error that the state allows us to submit corrections for. They just change it orange just to punish us and let us know that we messed up right there a little bit. So overall, we consistently meet our indicators. So we're doing a pretty good job. 
Um, the graduation indicator, the dropout, our discipline, our least restrictive environment, our preschool, and our child find are all consistently green. Currently, with inflection, we're addressing concerns of over-identification of students with specific learning disabilities. So that's the identified category. Um, so we're working in partnership with the Department of Education and Workforce and our state support team 10 for our disproportionate indicators 9 and 10. So that's what that's called when we over identify in a certain area. Um, those are indicators, where'd it go? 9 and 10. And if you look in the 2223 column, there's two red marks in a row. So that's what we're working with right now. So there are factors that we can't control that often affect our profile and our ratings. So these include resources, transient students, biases, discipline practices, socioeconomic factors, and advocate and parent involvement. So these are things that, as hard as we try, sometimes they just affect us negatively um, as a district and as a team. So for instance, if you look at the top row, which is the alternate assessment, and I don't know why they didn't give that one a number, but they didn't, um, you will see that we were consistently read from 2016 until 2021. Um, and that, that is to, due to no fault of our own, I'm gonna be honest. So in 2019, Ohio implemented new guidance establishing a 1% threshold testing students with the most severe and significant disabilities. Sometimes students move into our district. Sometimes we're required to provide certain services to them based on their needs, and it causes those ratios just to go up. And if we're doing our work with fidelity, there's nothing that we can do for that except take the red for it and you know, hope for the best the next year. So this is one of those instances where we have kids that have significant disabilities that really need to be tested in a specific way. Um, and so we did. So the good thing is in 22-23, we were able to meet that indicator and still service our kids um, within reason to the best of our ability. Good question. Yep. Alternate assessment is the actual name. It's the AESCD test, and it is, it's just an alternate state test. So in April, when all our kids are taking the regular assessment, there is an alternate assessment that's reserved for kids with severe and significant disabilities okay. that they'll be tested on. Okay. And so not meeting that means that we didn't get all of those kids tested, or we couldn't test them for their IEP, or not meeting it means that we tested everyone, but we got punished for going over the 1% that Ohio allotted us. 1% of our special ed population of students. So they, I'd have to read it word for word to you, okay. but they give us a 1% threshold mm -hmm. that they allow us to have as far as students being alternately assessed. And because our population, our percentage was more than that, then they gave us a red, not met. So they um, went. They only went only, 99% of our students need to take the standard assessment and only 1% should be allowed to take the alternate. You can say it that Even way. though we have 400 kids that yep. aren't getting special ed services. Yep. Am I missing or something? Does that sound like a good thing? It sounds like we're it testing sounds like we did the should. right thing. The state <laughs> just, Am I hearing that correctly? I'm glad you see it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it sounds like we're over-serving in that category? And we are giving students what they need. Yes. Which is fantastic. Yeah. Okay. So if you didn't hear my voice, it kind of dipped when we had the green for 22-23 because it's, it is what it is. Like, I'm we don't want to. make that green one. Kind of <laughs> well, it's a drop-down. I can turn it green if you want. <laughs> 
Ms. Bridges, I, I would think this is accurate. I think historically, the reason why the state or maybe the feds do that is that they don't want students to, hey, let's put them on alternate assessment. That means they aren't gonna take the regular test and they aren't gonna be in that, they aren't gonna be in our scores for a regular test. Yeah. Let's put them on the alternate assessment right. so they don't ding us on the regular test. And I, still, I think that's why the 1% is there. So people, so school districts don't put Game the system. Game the right. system on a regular test. So that's why that 1% is there. And, and so I don't know why 1%. Yeah. Okay. Someone that, that probably one percent at one point. I don't know. That's perfect. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, I think that's historically the, the meaning of the context or the, the reason behind why that is there. The 1%, I don't know why it's 1%, but. They vote on it. We vote on it. We all do. So there are certain times where Ohio will <clears throat> solicit opinions based on laws that they're going to change. So that would be a good time to. I only know what I've heard in the last two minutes, but yeah. when I hear students what they do, that sounds like a good thing. So. We try our best. I don't know what I was saying. <clears throat> okay, indicator three, um, right here. There are various subparts. Um, so this pertains to reading and math participation rates for state testing um, across the board, alternate and regular state testing for kids with disabilities. So this indicates the number of students on an IEP who should be state tested versus the number of students who actually were tested. So a red rating signifies a higher number of children who are opted out of testing by their guardian, which surpasses the allotted threshold that Ohio gave us. Currently, there is no action um, that our district can take and there's no action required. However, this area warrants close monitoring with ongoing efforts to educate and encourage parents about the advantages of their child participating in our state tests. Again, these factors, are out of our control um, and they do negatively impact our ratings which is not the most important thing obviously but it does show up it doesn't look as pretty so there are factors that are within our scope of control um, to help our profile and our ratings and they include professional development on Ohio indicators and ratings uh, response to intervention offered by our district data monitoring and analysis of special education documents, family engagement, that would be great, using the correct testing tools, um, discipline practices and documentation, reporting the correct data to EMIS, and continuing to service our students based on what's reasonable and proportionate. Finally, there are some blanks, which I've already talked about, so I'm gonna skip this line. Um, so think of it this way, ratings, are not a report card. That's not why. That's not why this is here. And red is not daunting because it's not our grade. Think of the profile as a GPS. Okay, it shows our current position, where we've been in the past, and it guides us back on course towards what is necessary for our students. So that's why there are no scores. There are no grades. Not officially. That would be the idea, and that was the scuttlebutt early on when this happened. Um, it hasn't really negatively impacted our district. We haven't had that many. Please. Yeah. 
Um, so just remember that dyslexia is not one of the big 14, so it would fall under another category, probably OHI or. It doesn't fall under learning disabilities? Or is it just It's a team decision, but okay. possibly. Right. Um, and then that over identifying, have we looked at? Or are we just over identifying because perhaps? I'm not asking you to give a definitive, but we have really engaged parents who it's a, get their kids checked out and really are, you know, so it's in the, notice. It's in the specific learning disability category, and it is a culmination of so many things. Um, us doing the right thing kids moving in with the diagnosis, um, and it was in a specific category of student. So we are looking at it. I'm working with Ohio, and I have a SST10 rep that I'm meeting with currently. Um, it's not anything that we can do. It's a more, more of a long-term process because we can't undiagnose a kid and we can't take them off or remove services if that's something that they really need. So it's, it's another one of those things where you don't know when you're in trouble until you get in trouble. Like you think you're going along and you're identifying and you're providing services and then you find out, oh, you've gone too far. Like you've reached the ceiling and you surpassed. So, um, but that's just based on number. Are they looking at an actual evaluation and saying, uh, you called that this, but it shouldn't have been. Yes. They are. So they're not just However, saying you have more than the average or? Yes. Yes okay. to all of those. Okay. So they are looking Maybe at records. Maybe there's more than the average. Maybe there's something in the water. I mean, who knows, right? Like. Well, our population is so small. Mm -hmm. In certain demographics, we, we do have more um, mm -hmm. identified because our, our population of student is so small. Mm -hmm. So we have to keep all that into consideration. And yes, Ohio does look at the ETR records. Um, I've found out recently more so than not what they're looking for is compliance as opposed to um, servicing need. So, um, it's catch 22. Yep. They're on our team, but they, they do help. They're very helpful. Um, it's job security. So, do you have any other questions? We can said something that jumped out at me it's about the things we can't control and one of the things you said was resources and are we talking about like money and how many teachers we have resources or are we talking about some other kind of resources that we truly can't control yes or like you can't control those resources we can control those resources so are we talking about other resources yes <laughs> yes other resources yes everything okay <laughs> <laughs> all right you can never have enough resources, some resources we can't special control, ed. right like i mean it might be hard and we might be running out of money and things but we it's not just money, it's, um, it's holistically, it's everything. It's um, new behaviors manifest and now we need new interventions or um, learning looks different. So now we have to address that with specific services. It's just all around. You can never have enough resources in special education because there's always something new coming. Um, kids always show up looking different, <laughs> acting different. And piggybacking That's, on the resources question, like is, I know we like, calculate per student spending? I mean, this might be a Mr. Lyman question, but Probably. is there a way like when a special ed student comes to our district, they come with, I mean, they do, the state does provide extra funding, is that, is that accurate? Most, of, sometimes, depending That is on the their EMIS question. Okay. I know that we get an allotted amount of money, and when they come from one district to another, that amount follows the kid. Right, is there a way that parents are able, or accountability for those funds, like to make sure Student A with, say, autism comes in, that those student funds that were intended for student A are spent on student A. Is there a way that we audit that or track that? I don't know if that's the intent, that, that, that is allocable to that kid. It's just the district has provided extra resources because they're, but not, they but have But not necessarily money. per IEP student. I don't think. Mr. No. Lining, nope. if he okay. says no. Depends on the disability, or whatever the term is. And that would be one of those underfunded mandates that are from the federal level that <laughs> probably would, uh, I'm going to make a best estimate, we'd probably get 15 to 20 percent of funding of what it really costs to educate um, students that maybe need some extra help and, and resources. 
And so that other 80 percent or, or whatever, that, again, that's a round number. That's a guesstimate right. that, that would come from, right. from us, of, 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 from the local level. Okay. Yeah. It's one of those underfunded mandates. Yes. And I just want to say, I heard you say best. Yes, of course, we would love it to be our best. Um, law says reasonable and appropriate. So I just want to make sure we all understand that. Um, so what can we do? <clears throat> early intervention initiatives. Um, we can develop programs for early identification in support of developmental delays and learning challenges before kids enter school and before they're put on the IEP. There's response to intervention, um, implementing a tiered support system like RTI or MTSS to assist all students, potentially reducing special education referrals, ongoing educator training, uh, providing continuous training for teachers on effective methods, diverse learning needs, and early identification of difficulties. The collaborative approach, fostering teamwork among, among educators, parents, administrators, and support staff to address student needs collectively. The universal design for learning, we can apply UDL principles to create inclusive learning environments accessible to all students. PBIS, positive behavior interventions and supports. Um, we can embrace this framework to promote positive behavior and prevent challenges, reducing the need for behavior-related special education services. <clears throat> and then family and community education. We can engage families and community members in supporting students with disabilities, providing resources and assistance as needed. So I will say this, I saved it for last, and I wholeheartedly believe this, and I have to be completely honest, not every issue is a special education issue, and not every differently abled child will qualify for special ed services. So the report card and the indicators ratings, that will take a long time. I have it if you want more information. Um, I, I, just, I just want, I particularly, and I don't know if the rest of you, I, I really want to learn more about how the state thinks we're doing on special ed because we don't have a lot of, it's very hard to evaluate special ed because all of these kids are individuals and are different. Um, and it's hard to parent kids in, uh, with disabilities because it, you don't have anything to compare them to, yeah. you know, so. Um, Did you get um, a copy of the presentation? Have you, no? This, oh, that was the last thing I was gonna ask you. This presentation? Yes, but we um, we received it as a PDF. So all the links okay. you're pointing out don't, don't, don't take it right there okay. as a PDF. So if we could get a, a live copy of sure. the presentation, that would be helpful. Well. So then start with all the indicators that were in the column, and then look at all the years, and I attached a comprehensive overview of everything inside of that year. You can look at the whole thing. Okay, cool. And then when you have questions, then that's when I, I would be able to help. I can't. Cool. Yeah. And as far as caseloads, I can tell you that right now. Um, elementary, ISs can go up to 16 children. Um, they can write up. This is a max or this is where we're at? This is the max. Okay, I want to know where we're at. Oh, oh okay. Like I, like I don't want to be at 
We're at 16. Case load, uh, state minimum service. I want to know where we're, where we're at and how we're doing. And maybe in comparison, that's a good, that's good to know. Um, yes. But I so know do you want to know by a staff member or just overview of? I don't need to know by staff member, but it helps me to know, like, hey, three years ago we had this many kids on IEPs and we had this many staff members, and so that's, this was an average case load. As opposed, now we have more sure. and we have the same number of teachers so the case looks way bigger yep. or maybe the case looks smaller. I don't know. Okay. Um, so to be able to look at it as a trend and in comparison to how many students we're serving. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's it's not on there, but the, the slide, you go back to that slide, right at the beginning there, uh, you saw the increase in the number of special ed students. Right. So again, if you, you know, just in general terms, there was an increase in numbers there yep. are the reasons like for, for next year we're increasing an uh, intervention specialist at the middle school because our numbers continue to grow. We've added um, at least two or three in the past couple of years because you see those increase in, in caseload. So as we're looking at the number that we're at 14 to 15, you know, mm -hmm. back to 16 or 13, we're, we're there and so we need to add an extra intervention specialist. And so we definitely get you that information, but in general terms, that's why yeah, I understand there should be an increase, but I, yes. like, I haven't been on the board since 2019, and I certainly can't add up in my head the number of times we have retired or someone has resigned or we have hired an intervention specialist to know, like, how many have we added or maybe subtracted or, sure. like, so to be able to compare those numbers um, and maybe even support staff as well, like, are, are we good on ISs, but we used to have way more. Paras than we than we do now. I don't know. Um, I think that was that. Continue to grow. Our special needs assistance as numbers continue to grow, and those those folks are harder to find. Those are harder to find. It's a and those numbers so continue to grow. It's a difficult job. I know it's one hard to care for. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And also to add about the you know the report card information. So again, it depends on what we uh, get, get that information. But if our goal for special ed students is how they're scoring on a state test once a year, then that report card data of how they score, then that's important. And obviously that's one piece of the, of the puzzle. And so the report card gives you how our how are our, our students, including special ed students, performing on this once or on these state tests once a year. Right. The report card takes into account a lot of things. And I know we have we've done deep dives in the past into the gifted population, right. and I would like to provide the same level of scrutiny to and just in general information learning yeah. to us and to the community about the special right, it's super helpful to see like even though those are red like that top category was red we still were doing what was ideal and best for students even though it is red so that was good information to have thank you Bridget. thank you thank you very much that was really thank you. Good. Uh, we have nobody tonight for our open communication period, so we will move into the superintendent's report. Thank you. So, um, new business, uh, six, uh, we're going to do a consent agenda certificate of license of employment, resignation leave of absence of no duty. That's A, which is A. Six B, support staff employment, resignation leave of absence. And then six C, substitute employment consent agenda uh, for six A, B, and C. Second. This is Dorn, then Dr. Pryor. And just to point out, um, one piece on here is Mr. Whalen, our assistant principal at the <coughs> high school, is now the new uh, principal at Senior High School. So congratulations to him. However, he will be he will be missed and has done a fantastic job uh, job the years he's been here and actually. Um, appropriately enough, one year he was our interim uh, special ed director also. And then, uh, next year he, uh, that one year. So, uh, good luck to Mr. so that was effective immediately? Cause I know no, that's effective at the end of the school year. Oh, okay. yeah, he's in, he'll be the principal at the scene, yeah. Will we? Okay. Okay. Got Turn your mic on. Oh, 
hopefully with my mic out, hopefully my teacher voice kind of went, no, it didn't, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. So if we vote no, he can't take the job. Right. It's one of those things. So again, to, to reiterate there, since my mic wasn't on, uh, Mr. Whalen, uh, new principal at Xenia High School and assistant principal here, effective end of the school year. And so congrats to him, but he will, he will be missed. He's done a nice job. All right, so tonight's consent agenda, 6A, 6B, 6C. It has been moved and seconded. Uh, any other discussion? Okay, Mr. Liming, please call the roll on tonight's consent agenda. Dr. Pryor? Yes. Mrs. Anderson? Yes. Mrs. Dorn? Yes. Mr. Kinsey? Yes. And Mr. Price? Yes. Take us to seven. Yep. Pages here. Summer athletic camps. Um, and you will see all of them there. Softball, youth, football, soccer, cross-country girls, and boys basketball and cheerleading youth camps. Mrs. Anderson and then Mrs. Dorn. And there were some on uh, last uh, month's uh, board agenda also, and so these are for the 2024 summer athletic games. Please call the roll. Mrs. Anderson? Yes. Mrs. Dorn? Yes. Mr. Kenzie? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes. Dr. Pryor? Yes. All right, um, out of state travel uh, for actually for Mrs. Richard, Special Education Director to attend the National Institute on Legal Issues of Educating Individuals with Disabilities and May 5th through the 8th in Savannah, Georgia. Is there a motion? So moved. Mrs. Second. Dorn and then Mrs. Anderson. Okay. So Mrs. Pritchard can continue to keep up on special education law and, and collaborate and network with other folks in the special education world. Mrs. Dorn? Yes. Mr. Kinsey? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes. Dr. Pryor? Yes. Mrs. Anderson? Yes. All right, uh, the next is our Green County ESC service agreement uh, for the 24-25 school year. So recommend approval of the service agreement with the uh, Green County Educational Service for supplemental services during the 24-25 school year at $2.9 million. Dr. Pryor and then Mrs. Anderson. And so um, uh, our, continu our costs continue to go up just like everybody else's costs. Um, we, the main uh, cost of our, our agreement with them is our preschool um, is run through Greene County Educational Service Center even though it's our students, the, the ESC runs that. Also OT, PT, and speech. Um, those days continue to increase also. Um, for to meet the needs of our students. We're also actually adding a day, another day of mental health services from them for next year. We added two this school year. We're adding one more day next year. Um, and this is ending up a little, last year ended up uh, just a little bit over $3 million. So we try to get a really good estimate of what it is, um, but um, we, we get fairly close. I know there's been a lot of talk and quite a few asks for additional mental health resources that might make people feel a little bit better. Um, the other thing I mentioned is that I know it is a cost savings for us to use them, right? Yep, If we definitely. were to fully staff and do this in-house, it would be much more expensive, correct? correct. Yep, so the ESC is, is an organization you're able to pool their services. For example, we'll have seven days of mental health services next year, and so to get somebody that's a person and a half, so they pull resources that that person then works in other school districts. So they do that with OTPT and speech and they're able to pull those resources together um, to service uh, districts in the county. Mm -hmm. yeah. Big price tag, but cost savings. Okay, it has been moved and seconded. Any other discussion? Okay. Mr. <coughs> Liming, please call the roll on our agreement with the ESC. <coughs> Mr. Kinsey? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes. Dr. Pryor? Yes. Mrs. Anderson? Yes. Mrs. Dorn? Yes. Next is a special meeting date. Um, so I don't know how the best way to do this. So the, the, some options um, in June for uh, with representative from K-12 Consulting to discuss the upcoming Treasure CFO search. 
since Mr. Liming is uh, re retiring again at the end of the calendar year here. So that's uh, uh, using that company to, to look for our new treasurer. So I don't know how we want to we want to discuss maybe the dates are and then make the actual recommendation resolution. Is that how we actually sure? To, so we aren't. I want to make Mr. Liming's life easier of not doing a, an amendment and doing all of that. Yeah, <laughs> you'll, you'll retire tonight to make too many uh, amendments and whatever else to that. So the dates that are possibilities are June 10th, 11th, 24th, and 25th um, to have a special meeting date where we then would go back into an executive session during that time. In the evening, yes, um, it could be as early as 5, it could be 6, could be 7, could be 5.30, 6.30. 615, whatever we would like to do. But in the evening, yes. All those dates work for me. Same here. I can do any day but the 10th. It is the graduation ceremony for the first day work. So okay. it might be a tight suit. Yep. Okay. But any of the other days. Okay. For me, I just want to know because my work schedule, sometimes I have pop up trips. So right now, I think all those are good. But As of right now, they're all yeah, good. All okay. of them can be bad, though, before. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And you, all of them work, all for, work for me. Do we want to do, do the you have a preference? Well, the week or the 11th is we have a board meeting that week, I believe. So do we want two in a week? Um, well, actually, the other one, we have another one in that week, too. So pick your poison, either beginning of the month or the end of the month of two, two meetings. I say beginning of the month. 11th? 11th. Can I make a motion that we add a special meeting on June 11th for the purpose of talking with the search firm? And we want that uh, at the Bellbrook Middle School and at what time? You want to do a little bit earlier? Yeah, the board I, office. I, and I feel like I think this, this first one is kind of an informational. Yes. Mm -hmm. it's not, I, I don't think it would be super long. Or, uh, but do we want to say... I don't, I don't know if people's meeting schedule. The board office would be mostly because I feel like they want to have a presentation that's part of audiovisual. Objections? Okay, sounds good. At what time? Six o'clock. The Year Education Center? Six o'clock? 1800. Six p.m.? And the reason we can't do a special meeting following one of our meetings is that the representative from K-12 is also a treasurer, and they have their board meetings exact same nights we do. Yeah, that's why, we have, that's why we have to pick a different so, night. Right. Okay, so I made a motion. Did anybody second? Second. Okay, Mrs. Anderson seconded. Good there, Mr. Liming. All right, cool. You captured what we need. Yep. Okay, please call the roll. Okay, Mr. Price? Yes. Dr. Pryor? Yes. Mrs. Anderson? Yes. Mrs. Dorn? Yes. And Mr. Kinsey? Yes. All right, donation recommend acceptance of donation from Lal Zama in the amount of $400 to Stephen Bell Elementary Principals Fund. Second. Mrs. Dorn, Mrs. Anderson? Super generous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Please call the roll. Dr. Pryor? Yes. Mrs. Anderson? Yes. Mrs. Dorn? Yes. Mr. Kinsey? Yes, with gratitude. And Mr. Price? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we have a draft. Uh, this, this, these are items for information and discussion. So um, this is a first read on the draft for the 2025 26 school calendar. So not next year, the year after. Um, so admin reps had worked on uh, a couple options and then SEA had a draft of their option and so when we put all the parameters again in place of um, you know ending the first semester before the before winter break ending second semester end of the school year before Memorial Day um, and trying to keep things as somewhat as even as possible in each quarter and so forth, we kind of come up with the same kind of schedule. And actually, 
we, uh, you know, the first draft, first read here, but this is essentially the proposal that SEA had made to us. Um, um, there, there was some discussion at the beginning of opening day of when to have that teacher work day, but besides that, this is the exact calendar that SEA had, and ours was just a day off at the beginning or the end, so they were beyond one, one or two days, they were exactly the same anyway. So, um, any discussion on, on that? Um, this will, will bring that back for the, uh, a final, or a second read and approval at the next board meeting. And remind me, this looks pretty close to this current year? Yep, pretty they're pretty all close. pretty much the, the, the same. When we put all those parameters in place, they look eerily the same. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right, very good. I have a question. Is it sure. all possible to get the Monday after Um, I think it's been done in the past. Yeah, the, the, again, the, the challenge with, with that is then either we have to start the school year or the staff first day on a Friday or we have to have the last day for staff after Memorial Day. And this is, we're off on April 3rd, April 3rd is that good Friday this year, or this is two years from now. All I know is probably 200 cooks were in this kitchen for, for this, yeah. and it's, it's a little difficult maybe right. to come in at the end. And, and, and the other pieces we tried to also then at some point a few years ago of uh, tried to have some uh, national, or, or um, yeah, federal holidays off, such as Veterans Day, such as was there MLK and President's Day, and so trying to do some of those also. How about that is something that we can keep in mind for the next calendar, um, if that would be okay. Because this is, like I said, we've been working on this for a while, and um, this is um, what the SEA had proposed, and was extremely similar to what we had proposed. No school board meeting on my birthday next year. <laughs> All right. Please. In that case, we'll call it special meeting. You guys, <laughs> you guys vote on the calendar. You guys vote on the calendar, so on that calendar. Okay. Um, so I'll bring that back uh, next month. All right. Um, next is another item of information that um, as part of the, the use of these funds, I am required to share this information with uh, the board. So this is uh, the Disadvantaged Pupil Impact Aid and the Student Wellness and Success Funds. And so these are funds that are earmarked, but they're within the general fund money we get from the state. And so we have to partner uh, with uh, organizations around the area. And so we're partnering with the Green County Educational Service Center Montgomery County Educational Service Center and the school-based mental health services at the Green County Educational Service Center. So we received about $170,000 um, combined for these funds and most of those funds were in the Student well Wellness and Success Funds. And so the way we are spending that money, we have to spend it by the end of next fiscal year, so the FY25 fiscal year. Um, we are, um, and like I mentioned, the school-based mental health services from the ESC, we added two additional days this year, and so that's an additional $42,000, and then next year we're adding one additional FTE day, so that's an additional $21,000 or so, so that is a little over $100,000 um, that we're able to use out of these funds. Um, 
The second half of this school year, we added a part-time counselor at Stephen Bell Elementary. That's just for the second semester of this school year. That cost about $22,000 uh, to provide extra supports for Stephen Bell. That will go away after this school year as we are adding an assistant principal over there for next school year. Obviously, they don't do the same, exactly the same thing, obviously, but uh, an extra person of support over there. Um, and then also a literacy coach uh, from the Montgomery County Educational Service Center that has worked uh, with our teachers at Stephen Bell on the implementation of, of science of reading, and that goes along with all dyslex dyslexia and the science of reading and literacy and so forth. So um, we have an excellent coach from the Montgomery County ESC that has been working with those teachers on, on implementation of the science of reading and ensuring, um, and they're doing a fantastic job over there. So that has been a good ad for this school year. And then also of uh, implementing or continuing a two-way communication systems or even our, or even our current system where that contract is up and doing that for next year or looking at a different piece of software that's Parent Square for next school year. So and all those amounts are, are approximate um, and we're about at $170,000 there. So we have until the end of next fiscal year to actually spend all of these dollars. So any questions about this? Okay. I like that it sounds like it directly touches students where possible. So thank you for doing yep. that. It's kind of what, kind of like COVID ESSER funds, you got to spend it on something. And right. I, I think you did a fantastic job of spending that. And thank you for doing silly things with that money. We're doing it where it actually touches students. So yep. thank you. You're welcome. All right. That's it. Uh, is that it? Yep. Okay. Anybody have anything else they'd like to mention? I just want to make sure we keep it on our front burner. Um, Mrs. Dorn had mentioned it at the last meeting about a student liaison to the board. Um, I think that that is worth it. <laughs> um, I just, and I did a little bit of research, like Centerville does them, Northmont, um, Valley View, um, so it's in West Carrollton, so it is something that is done. So just adding that extra layer of um, you know, stakeholder I think it's great. Yeah, we, we've reached out, had meetings, um, I know, with, with the union. It's been fantastic spending time. We've made offers to um, administrators. Uh, yeah, if, I don't know what, but if a board member can meet with student liaison or something, or maybe we can look at options. That's a great way to hand. Yeah, okay. Not to add anything else to Mr. Hanks, please. <laughs> we can look into that and bring back information at a, okay. a, a future meeting okay. soon. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Uh, it's important I read what's given to me. So uh, at this time, I move uh, that we move to executive session for the purpose of preparing for, conducting, or reviewing negotiations with employees regarding their compensation or other terms and conditions of their employment per RC 121.22G4. Does my motion have a second? Second. I heard Dr. Pryor. Okay, please call the roll. Mrs. Anderson? Yes. Mrs. Dorn? Yes. Mr. Kenzie? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes. Dr. Pryor? Yes. Good. We are in executive session at 818. Uh, we will take no action whatsoever, but you're welcome to hang around if you want to.
Live? We are out of executive session at 9.48. Would somebody like to make a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Mrs. Dorn, seconded by Mrs. Anderson. When you're ready, please call the roll. Mrs. Dorn? Yes. Mr. Kinsey? Yes. Mr. Price? Yes. Dr. Pryor? Yes. Mrs. Anderson? Yes. We are adjourned at 9.49.